Hello, and welcome to the Just and Center podcast. I am your host, Dr. Jordan Cooper. Thank you so much for joining me once again, as always, on the program today. And I do just want to give you all a quick reminder that Just and Center, as an organization, is supported by donors. So if you do have an interest in helping out our organization and all the things that we do, go to justincenter.org, go to our donate page. Many of you say that you'd love to help out and you've appreciated the organization, you appreciated the, the YouTube channel and the books and the podcast, but you're not able to give anything financially. There are still things you can do to help us out. So what we have done is we've created a brochure that is something that can be printed off and given to people that you think might have an interest in helping out the work that we do. That doesn't mean they have to be somebody who's regularly listening to or watching the material that we produce, but somebody who understands the necessity of reaching people through this medium that is going to lead people into pews in Lutheran churches. And so if you can print this out, give it to people in your church, give it to an elder, give it to your pastor, your missions board, and share with them what we've done for you, the, the, how we have blessed you and your uh, walk with Christ, and how we have done this for others, and this will be a major help for us. So we're trying to expand our donor base at this point, and so even if you can't give yourself, you can help spread the word. So go to justincenter.org, go to our donate page, you can download the brochure, it's a PDF, you can either send it out, or you can print it out and um, share it that way. And we also have a video on why donate to Justin Center that goes along with that. That's also there on the donate page. All right, now I want to jump into the topic today. And the, the topic today, we're, we're getting back to the Augsburg Confession. It's been a little while since we have discussed the Augsburg Confession, and we are pretty close to toward the end here. And we are in the midst of the second section, which is Articles on abuses which have been corrected. So the first section of the Augsburg Confession is, is doctrinal points, and then the second portion of the Augsburg Confession delves into uh, many of the abuses that have shown up in, in the church in the medieval period that the Reformation is dealing with and correcting. So, we are in Article 25, which is on confession. And so we're going to talk about the practice of confession. Some of this has already been discussed when we looked at the, the idea of absolution. We have a separate program on that. So if you want to look at that, you'll find some of the same material, some of the same information here that you will have gotten there. But it, this should be a good supplement to that. So if you haven't watched that and you want to learn more, you can do that as well. I did a whole series on confession and absolution on the podcast a number of years ago. It's not on video, so you can't find it on YouTube, but you can go to the podcast archives. By the way, many of you ask about podcast archives and say, well, I can't get past the last hundred episodes because that's what shows up on you know your podcast app, whatever it might be. Um, if you go to the justincenter.org website and you go to the Justin Center podcast link there, it's going to bring you to uh, the Liberated Syndication page, which is the, the program that we use to host all of the podcasts. And it will have the entire archive going back to what 20, 2012. So you can find lots of stuff there, even if you can't find it on YouTube or on your podcast app. Okay. Well, uh, we are going to be talking today about not just about the theology of confession and absolution, though we will be talking about that, but we will start exploring what are some of the issues that showed up within the medieval church that the reformers are responding to here. So I'm going to start reading, and again, this is from Charles Krauss' edition of the Augsburg Confession. You can find this on our website, justicecenter.org. Okay. Confession is not abolished in our churches, for it is not usual to communicate the body of our Lord except to those who have been previously examined and absolved. And the people are taught most carefully concerning the faith required to absolution, about which before these times there has been a deep silence. Men are taught that they should highly regard absolution, inasmuch as it is God's voice pronounced by God's command. That's the first paragraph. We're going to go into some of the other paragraphs to look at more specifics here, but this is a helpful outline of what the practice of confession is and uh, how Lutherans view the confession and absolution. So the, the practice of confession and absolution is something that is familiar to Christians today, even if you've never engaged in that practice yourself, if you've never been Roman Catholic or you're not in a, a parish that really practices it or you've never just never taken advantage of it, you at least know it from movies, right? We've got, uh, it's a common 
trope in movies that you have somebody go to a priest to confess their sins. And it, it works for storytelling because when you do that, you're able to have a bit of exposition about what somebody's done or wrestle with inner thoughts that they're able to to share in that kind of context. You've probably seen it at least in, in movies or on a television show even if you haven't uh, engaged in the practice of, of confession yourself. But it is expected in the Roman Catholic tradition that you are regularly seeing your priest and you go to what is called the confessional. And when you're in the confessional, you confess your sins, as the name implies. And after confessing your sins, the priest will do two things. There is uh, an absolution, but then there also is a penance that is given. And the penance is given in accord with the severity of your sins. Often the penance is related to the sins that you have confessed. And I'll talk a little further as we move on about the theology behind that. But that's the general gist of how this works in, in practical life. Now, within the medieval period, confession was required. This is something that was expected of all Christians. And so, like many of the things that we have been talking about with the Reformation, the Rome, is, Rome is constantly using the accusation that the Reformers have gotten rid of practices that are part of the historic church. They have erased doctrines that have been part of the church for, well, since basically its beginning. And so we see this throughout the Augsburg Confession. There is a defense of the doctrine of the Trinity, the way we express the two natures of Christ. And there is this constant refrain that we do not depart from the Catholic faith. We are not teaching the things that you are claiming that we are teaching. So confession was simply another point at which the reformers are, are facing accusations. And the accusation toward them is you have totally abolished the practice of confession altogether. And so, in the Augsburg Confession, there was this clarification to say, we have not abolished confession. This is still, just as it was in the medieval Roman church, it is still very much a part of our regular practice. And we'll talk about the specifics of what that means that it's part of our practice. But to, to just be a little bit honest here about where things have gone in, in history, at one time, it was very much standard that there was a, a, both a private confession and absolution among Lutherans that was expected prior to you receiving the Eucharist, as well as a confessional service, which was a special service that you would attend on a Saturday to confess your sins and be forgiven by, by the pastor. So, in various different ways, Lutherans have had in history this practice of confession and absolution. Unfortunately, within the 20th century, the confessional service started to disappear. The practice of private uh, confession and absolution became less and less common to the point that often it is unknown in congregations today. And there are a number of factors that I think led to this. Some of it is that the Lutheran church was just influenced by American Protestantism. I think there are a lot of things within, within Lutheranism, and this is true about like all churches as well. We're all impacted by the environment that we are in. But because of the very much reformed uh, milieu that the, the church is in within the United States, or it was historically, a lot of the practices or, or tempers or attitudes of those reformed and then evangelical and revivalist churches did start to seep over into other churches. Now, it's not just the Lutherans. This happens in Rome as well. <laughs> Talk to traditionalist Roman Catholics about what, what happens and. Uh, you know, the Novus Ordo masses, especially in the U.S. and some of the strange things that have happened. So, there are some unfortunate departures from historic Lutheran tradition that have occurred, I think, just because of some of that outside influence. So, that's part of it. But the other is that there was a moving of the confession and absolution from a separate service into the ordinary Sunday morning divine service. So, this is what you're going to see today. This is not part of all historic Lutheran liturgies. It is also often there in a different form when you look at older Lutheran liturgies. So, the way that the confession and absolution happens in a Lutheran service today tends to be the congregation confesses their sins and the pastor proclaims, declares publicly, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Right? You have the declaratory forgiving of sins that arises through the mouth of the pastor. Now, that proclamatory delivering of the forgiveness of sins was something that in the past was really 
reserved more for the context of private absolution or some of those confessional services. And what you see in a lot of other Lutheran liturgies, and, and there are different there are different liturgies from different nations at different times. So I'm not talking about you know universally, and I'm not going through a bunch of specific liturgies. I could do that, but this is not the place to do that. Uh, you could just do a quick search for public domain Lutheran hymnals in the United States. Uh, if you if you really want to explore this, just read some of the absolutions that show up there. And it is more of a an assurance of pardon, like you have in the Reformed churches. It is not this kind of proclamatory "I forgive you." that tended to be more in these confessional services in those circumstances. So, what happens is that using of the office of the keys kind of moved from the private setting and the confessional service setting into every Sunday morning service. So, it's not that the church had totally gotten rid of the use of the office of the keys, but it has tended to move from the private to the public. Now, I like having the public absolution, confession absolution in the service, so I'm not saying that this is a bad thing, and it is still a way that people are receiving the forgiveness of sins. It's not like you receive the forgiveness of sins less from the mouth of the pastor exercising the office of the keys in a public setting than you do a private one. But the there is something you're missing, and that is that there is something that is beneficial about confessing your sins particularly. And you have the general confession. And it is the expectation that in the general confession on a Sunday morning, you are taking the time to actually think about your particular sins within this last week. That's why we have this time of silence. And really, it's good to meditate on that prior to coming to the service on Sunday so that you've been meditating on the reality of your sins, hopefully each day throughout the week or at least one day throughout the week. And so when you come to that confession on Sunday morning, you have actually done the work in your heart of of letting the law expose the nature and reality of your sins so that it does become particular. Uh, but there often can be something that is freeing and helpful about just saying the things out loud and hearing, saying it to a pastor and hearing the I forgive you directly after you've confessed your specific sins. So it's it makes it more specific to do something in, in private. Now, that doesn't mean that private absolution is an absolute necessity. And this is something we'll see as we talk a little bit about the history of confession and absolution in the church. A private absolution is really an early medieval practice. So it's not something that has existed since the beginning of the church. It is something that developed. There are good reasons why it developed. It can be very beneficial. But the question is, do we then put it in the category of absolute necessity? Well, it is a necessity to exercise the office of the keys. It's commanded, Matthew 16, Matthew 18, and John 20. We have multiple passages that are very clear that it is of the essence of the office of the ministry that they receive the, the, the keys of the kingdom of heaven in their pastoral office, and they are to exercise those keys by doing two things, forgiving sins and retaining sins. That is a command of Christ that was granted to the church. So, there is no option for the pastor as to whether that office of the keys is exercised. That's a necessity. However, how exactly that is done has differed in the history of the church. So we can't put private confession in the category of, of absolute necessity. However, there are good reasons to do it. There is a reason why it developed, and there is a reason why the Lutheran reformers still recommend doing it in, in the Augsburg Confession. So, what Melanchthon is saying here in the Augsburg Confession is that he doesn't say it is impossible to give the body and blood of the Lord without that private confession, but he says it is usual. It is the usual practice. It is the general practice that the one who receives the body and blood of Christ has confessed their sins and has been absolved. This statement says a significant amount not only about the nature of confession and absolution, but also about guarding the table. There is a loosening of who can come to the table that has occurred within the American church generally. And to some degree, I think this is an overreaction. If you look at the, the American Puritans, look at the Jonathan Edwards era, the Great Awakening, a lot of people were barred from the table. Too many people were barred from the table. There was this concern because of things like the Great Awakening, you had these revival movement. There was the concern that, well, some people aren't genuinely converted. 
because you've got all this weird kind of fanaticism going on and people like Edwards recognize that's not all genuine conversion. People are just kind of swept up in the movement, right? Swept up in what's happening at the moment. And you see this today if you look at big charismatic movements. You know, you, you know you've got plenty of the people there that are just like, ooh, this is exciting. And they get their emotions all riled up and, and they probably don't actually have a, a repentant heart. And so because of that, there was this barring of the table in a way that you had to basically prove the reality of your saving faith, the reality of your regeneration before you were allowed at the table. And this was far too restrictive in that it depended largely upon an examination of one's own internal experience. So because of that, I think there was kind of an overreaction against that, and it's right to react against that. Um, but the initial Lutheran practice was that there would have to be a confession and absolution. Now, in the confession, you are not, as a pastor, when somebody confesses their sins to me, I am not listening to them to see if they're sincere, if their voice sounds sincere enough, or if their affections are right, or what motive they have for going there. That is not my job. I cannot examine the nature of someone's inner heart or dispositions. What my job is, is to hear their repentance, take their word for it, and then proclaim God's forgiveness to them. But unfortunately, that kind of examination, confession, absolution has often been uh, kind of relegated to, to the side. We've, we've put that to the side and said, well, that's not that important. And we've done this in a couple ways. So within Lutheran churches, you get this debate about closed communion versus open communion versus close communion. And I don't want to get into the particulars of those debates, but I do want to say that I think that there is a problem that really shows up in all positions that tend to be present. And this is something, not, not saying I'm, this is something that I've totally resolved either, but it is something that I think is, is worth thinking about, especially in light of this, which is what we tend to do in terms of who receives communion in our, in our churches. We tend to think about it just doctrinally. So in Lutheran churches, it's very common to say that you cannot come to the Lord's table unless you share our faith. You know, if you con confess the words of Luther's small catechism, which is the most the basic confession of faith for, for Lutherans, if you can look at the small catechism and say, I agree to that, because you recognize that the Lord's Supper is not just an individual matter, but it also is a confession of the church, of the local community gathering together. It's a profession as well about what's happening here, so that if you disagree fundamentally about the theology of the Lord's Supper, it, it disrupts the unity of the table. And... That's the argument for closed communion. But along with that, oftentimes what we like to say is, well, if you agree with these doctrinal points, you can come to the table. And it unfortunately kind of divorces the pastor from the, the actual person communing in that necessary work of examination. Someone could come to the altar, you know, in their an LCMS person, they tell me they're LCMS. I have never met this person. I have no idea what the standing in their church is. Um, I have no idea what, what they're doing with their life. I don't know if they're living in unrepentant sin. I don't know any of this stuff. However, because they are in a sister church body that we are in fellowship with, you know, I commune. And, and that, is, that is the general practice. But I do think that we need to be thinking more seriously about this because the way that, that Melanchthon, the Augsburg Confession, speaks about this is more than just, I accept that you agree with our doctrine but it's that I know that your sins are forgiven and I know that you have confessed your sins. And that's how we judge repentance. So I'm not giving a solution. <laughs> All I'm saying is I think this is important. It is something that I will say that I did really appreciate in my time in the RPCNA, the Reformed Presbyterian Church of North America, very strict Scottish exclusive psalmist Presbyterians. <laughs> um, uh, they're they're kind of my favorite Presbyterians though. And not just because I went to Geneva College, but they're my favorite Presbyterians because they're very Presbyterian and they're just really committed to their theology and they're unique and they stick with their exclusive psalmody. I like when people are who they are and, and are committed to that, to their confession of faith and just are proud of it. So I think there's something really to be admired about that. But something I, I did appreciate, I didn't appreciate the fact that they only celebrated communion like four times a year, but but was that there had to be a kind of interview process with with the presbyters, with the elders prior to coming to the table. And that kind of thing may seem unwelcoming. It may seem like it's not fair, but there is something to just that pastoral care 
just knowing who those people are that are coming to, to the table. So that certainly was the expectation at this time. And it's different now because people travel all over the place. It, at this time, it's not like nobody traveled, but generally you have the same people in your community. You know the people in your community. You know the people who are coming to the altar. And so you have this very personal relationship with your congregants that they are confessing and you are, you are absolving. So this is all to say that communion is taken very seriously and it is acknowledged that in regular practice, there should be this relationship of confession and absolution in order to admit you uh, to the table. So this was just retained. Now, the, the nature of confession and some of the elements, especially with regard to penance, do start to shift with the reformers, but not the practice of confession itself. Okay, and then second, there is a mention in this paragraph about the necessity of the faith that is required in absolution. And I know there's been pushback from Roman apologists. They say, we never taught that you know, this, this ref reformational understanding of ex opera operato. And it, it, the, essentially the understanding is this, that the sacraments basically just work regardless of whether or not you have faith. And that's certainly not Rome's position as it's defined today. And Trent was clear about that and the Catholic Catechism is very clear about that today. But I would challenge the notion that this just wasn't the case. There are, and I've done some reading on some articles, I may actually do a whole program on supposed misunderstandings of the reformers of the Roman church to demonstrate that a lot of things that they said the Roman church taught, they actually did teach <laughs> very clearly at the time. They corrected those things, and thankfully so, but didn't really credit the reformers, who were really the ones that kind of showed the error of these things, but that, that's fine. <laughs> so, um, but it was very clearly the case in, in not all, but in some theologians of the era, and especially in popular practice, that it was understood that as long as you confessed your sins, there wasn't an emphasis on the necessity of, of heartfelt repentance or faith. And so it was kind of this mechanical, as long as I say all the right things, I'm forgiven. And so the reformers are saying, well, what we're doing is we're keeping the practice of confession and absolution, but we are bringing back the central focus as to where it should be, which is not just the mechanical act of confessing sins, not that that's a bad thing, that's a good thing, but what we are emphasizing is the necessity of faith in Christ, the necessity of a repentant heart. And so it's through repentance and faith that we are absolved, not just through the act of listing sins. And so the, the idea here is that, that Melanchthon is trying to contend for is that we are keeping the practice as it developed in a very good way, but we are recentering the practice around Christ and faith in Christ, which is what it should have been and was supposed to be all along. Then there is, uh, there is a mention here that the voice of the pastor in absolution is God's voice. And it's pronounced by God's command. Now, this is something that non-Lutherans have a really hard time with. If you are not from a Lutheran tradition, if you come from especially a more low church tradition and you come to a Lutheran service, and you hear the pastor saying, I forgive you all of your sins, that could turn you off totally. And you say, these Lutherans are crazy. They think pastors have special powers to forgive sins and I'm leaving and never coming back. <laughs> I've had this experience with people multiple times inviting them to from church because it's, it's weird. So I try to prepare people for this and explain a theology of absolution because I know that that's prior to their coming to the service because I know that that's going to be the one thing that's really going to stand out. And yes, they're going to come to the service and say, oh, you guys look very Catholic, but uh, that's usually not as much of an issue as the, the absolution. So they say, well, only Christ has the power to forgive sins. So this is a very important part of that theology. When the pastor is saying, I forgive you all of your sins, it is not that there is some special power in the pastor himself where he somehow has the ability to just forgive sins on his own. Instead, this is the very voice of God speaking. So God speaks through the mouth of the minister. So the language that we often use is in persona Christi. And in that, when you are looking at the pastor saying, I forgive you all of your sins, don't see the pastor. Don't think about the pastor. See that as if Jesus himself is standing in front of you saying that to you, I forgive you. It doesn't mean the pastor is Jesus. 
what it does mean at that moment, it is the word of Christ coming through the mouth of the pastor. So it is really Christ doing the absolving. It is Christ forgiving the sins. But just as God uses ordinary things to do his work, like in baptism, the Lord's Supper, the word of God using human hands to declare things, so he uses human mouths to declare things that are his own testimony. And so, when the pastor says, I forgive you all of your sins, that is God himself saying, sinner, repentant sinner, I forgive you all of your sins. And where do we get that from scripturally? Well, I could point to a few different places, and in the absolution video that I did earlier, I did spend time on each of those passages. So, I would really urge you to look at that if you do want to get some more uh, clarity in terms of treat uh, where we where we get these things from scripture. And you can also go to those older podcasts that I did here. But let me look just at one quickly. So you see the scriptural precedent, I'll remind you of this. And this is in John chapter 20, just after the resurrection and just prior to the ascension, Jesus says this to the apostles. Peace to you as the father, is John 20, 21. Peace to you as the father has sent me, I also send you. This is the role of the apostles. As the Son is sent by the Father, the apostles literally mean the ones who were sent. They are sent out into the world to bring forth the word of God into the world. He breathes on them and says to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So, this is exuflation, as it's called. There is a breathing out of the Son. He breathes out the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit now comes upon the apostles. And the Holy Spirit is the one who gives the authority for what they're saying here. It's, it's the Spirit's power that allows what he says below, which is, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Note, and I'm just looking at the English here because we're not getting depth into this because of the nature of this series. <laughs> so, I want to get more depth, so I'm stopping myself. Um, he's saying, if you personally forgive sins, Notice that Jesus does not say, if you declare the forgiveness of sins, if you point to the atonement, if you point to their faith where their sins are forgiven, he specifically says the apostles, they forgive the sins. And if they forgive the sins, those sins are forgiven. And if they retain the sins, those sins are retained. So, to say that the pastor can forgive sins is simply to obey the word of Christ and take him seriously when he says to the apostles, that if they forgive sins, they are forgiven. And this is clearly not in the power of the people themselves. This is why this follows the giving of the Holy Spirit, because it is a divine power. It's God doing this work. So, as Jesus, this, this is connected to the I send you, just as the Father sent him. So, he sends the apostles, in other words, as representatives of him, and it's through his Holy Spirit that they have the ability now and the responsibility to proclaim the words of Jesus as he speaks through them so that they can really forgive sins. So, why is it that it's only in this place, right, that we say that the pastor is, you know, in persona Christi? And you could say this maybe with the sacraments as well, um, with, you know, the Eucharist, but we're not saying this all the time about the pastor, but it's because of the particularity of the command of Jesus that this is his sending us to do exactly this by the power of the Holy Spirit to forgive sins. So, there is a, a the basic biblical argument from John chapter 20. The keys of the kingdom are connected to this in Matthew 16, Matthew 18. There is a debate about the nature of those keys. And I'm not going to get into that here, but there is a debate about whether the keys are given, because they're given to the apostles, and it's clear that they're given to the church. Matthew 18 is very clear. Right, so, 16, we've got the keys given to Peter, and R Rome's favorite part, <laughs> right, about, of all these passages. Uh, and then you have in, in Matthew 18, the keys are given to the whole church. And then John 20, they're given to the apostles. So, the question is, how do these texts all line up? Is it that the keys are given to every Christian because it's given to the church? Or is it that the apostles, because they're the ones that are sent, and now they are the ones that are the leaders of the church, the pastors are going to be called to be the ones who follow the apostles, and in that authoritative role of proclaiming the word of God, is it that they are given to the pastors? So, there are some pietist movements that have argued for uh, strongly for a lay absolution, and you can even 
find this argument within Luther's uh, on the Babylonian captivity of the church. And uh, I don't follow that practice. I think I, I understand where it comes from because I, I recognize that there is some difficulty in looking at these passages and figuring it out because Jesus doesn't specify clearly, right? He doesn't say here, oh, and by the way, this key, these keys are only to be used by the pastors. So, the way that, that I tend to put these passages together with this question is, first, you've got it given to Peter, and Peter is kind of the chief of the apostles, and the keys are dependent upon his profession, his profession that Jesus is the Christ. So, Peter there is representative of the leaders of the church, he's representative of the apostles, but it's also dependent upon his public confession. Then you have Matthew 18, which is the whole church, and then you have John 20, which is the apostles. Jesus doesn't say this to, you know, Mary Magdalene. He doesn't, there's no indication that he is saying this to the other very important followers that he has that are not the apostles. But these are the same ones that are now going to use the power of the Holy Spirit to go be the first pastors, be the ones to proclaim the word of God. So, the position that I tend to take is that the keys are given to the church as a whole. However, the pastors are the ones that are called to exercise that office. In other words, they don't belong in essence to the pastor. So, that there, it's not that the pastor receives, uh, Rome talks about an indelible character. That's not part of our theology. So, that there is no indelible character that changes the nature of the pastor so that now he ontologically, in terms of his being, now he can forgive sins. Instead, the keys belong to the church as a whole. However, the pastor is the one who is to speak on behalf of the church to the church to have that teaching proclamatory role. Therefore, it is the pastor who exercises the office of the keys. Okay, so let's move on here a little bit. This is a longer section, and I'm already halfway through my time here. The power of keys is honored and mention is made, how great consolation it brings to terrified consciences, and that God requires faith, that we believe that absolution as a voice sounding from heaven, oh, what a beautiful phrase, that this faith in Christ truly obtains and receives the remission of sins. And so we have here this constant concern of comforting terrified consciences, and this is the beauty of absolution. If you are burdened by sin and there is a sin that you just you can't get the voice out of your head that you are guilty, you are guilty, you are guilty, and you, you, you've probably had this experience as a Christian. I've had this experience. You, you have a sin that you just can't let go of and, and you kind of know that you're forgiven, but you don't feel like you are and you just keep coming to God over and over again in prayer saying, please forgive me, please forgive me over and over and over and over again. And, and the forgiveness, of course, is objective. It doesn't depend on how you feel about it, but but there is the reality of your feelings there. Well, when you are able to bring that kind of thing to a pastor and hear directly and have someone speak to you, not just you thinking about it in your own head, that's powerful. There, there's power in the proclamatory word of voice that God is speaking through that says that you hear it in your ears, you are forgiven of that particular sin. So, there's, there's beauty in that. There's comfort in that. And that's what Jesus told his apostles to do. And so, the, the desire here on behalf of the Lutherans, the concern is that of the terrified conscience to say that your sins are forgiven and ultimately there is this working together of the absolution and faith because this is how the sacraments and faith work together is that the sacraments are the means by which God delivers his forgiveness and faith is that which trusts that thing and receives it for oneself. And so, the, the absolution is proclaimed because it's true, the, the absolution is there, the forgiveness is true, it's been won on the cross. And faith then grabs that objective absolution, that forgiveness that the pastors put out there because it's yours and applies it to you so that it becomes yours and you are indeed forgiven. Let's move on. Af aforetime, satisfactions were immoderately extolled of faith and the merit of Christ and justification by faith no mention was made. Wherefore, on this point, our churches are by no means to be blamed. For this, even our adversaries are compelled to concede in regard to us, that the doctrine of repentance is most diligently treated and laid open to us. And so, let's talk about what happens in the medieval period. Now, how does this notion of, say, penance, how, how does that work? Where does that come from? 
Now, in Roman Catholic medieval theology, this is not the case in the early church, but in medieval theology, in, in some ways, all of medieval theology is dependent upon this particular distinction that Rome makes, and that is a distinction between uh, the, the eternal consequences of sins and then the temporal penalty of sins. So, this is how Rome, for example, can say that all of the eternal consequences of sins are paid for by Christ, he takes care of those, but still can talk about the necessity of merit in terms of forgiveness, not forgiveness of those eternal consequences, but more of a satisfaction of those temporal punishments. So, the concept behind us is that when you commit a mortal sin, you are cut off from a state of grace, and you have to confess that mortal sin to be brought back into a state of grace. And that is paid for by Christ. Of course, oh yeah, there, there's more to say about that too, because I think even in the Middle Ages, it's not that simple either. And this does play into the medieval idea of Eucharistic sacrifice. And I'm very clear to say medieval, because I think a lot of the confusion that showed up in some of these figures was very much corrected post-Trent, thankfully. But there at least is a notion in some medieval thinkers that seems to imply that the death of Christ basically paid for original sin and that the, the sacrifice of the Eucharist pays for additional sins. And, and there is this kind of separation from the, of, of the atonement and the understanding of Eucharistic sacrifice. Uh, and so, I can, get, I can substantiate that. I'm not just saying it's out of nowhere. So, again, I'm planning to do a program going into some of this because I think it's important. But All right. Um, so, that's, that idea was really essential for the development of what happened in the medieval period with confession and absolution. And so, this is to say that in confession, the priest absolves you of your mortal sins so that you are not going to hell. However, there is this temporal punishment. Ultimately, a temporal punishment for your sins is what you are going to be paying for in purgatory. So, if you're in purgatory, you're, you're getting to heaven. You're going to get there eventually. But in medieval understanding, and I know this has changed today, but in medieval understanding, it was clear that purgatory was expected to be many hundreds and likely thousands of years of suffering. And so, in that time of purgation, you are basically suffering the satisfaction this, they're satisfying the demands of, of God upon your sins, the, what they call the temporal consequences. So, you are suffering for your sins for hundreds or thousands of years, and in order to get out of that, you can do some things in life t today to take that suffering away from purgatory. You can satisfy those demands by penance. So, these works take years away from purgatory so that now you have, you could satisfy, you know, whatever demands God has put upon you in terms of this, these temporal consequences of sin. Um, and you can also do that by buying indulgences. That's what leads to the Reformation in the first place. You can do this by going on a crusade. This was motivation for crusaders to have your, your time in purgatory forgiven. All you got to do is, you know, go, <laughs> go kill some people and you've got, to, <laughs> got some time off purgatory. There you go. And there's, there's more to the Crusades than just that, to be clear, and I know. <laughs> so, I know you're going to say, the Crusades aren't, are more than that, they're misrepresented, they are, but I'm not getting into that. Um, so, with all of that being said, that's the system that shows up in the medieval period. Now, where does it come from initially? There is no such thing as a private confession, as far as we know, within the early church. So, in the first centuries of the church, we did have questions about what we would today call church discipline. This surrounded a particular controversy, which was and a re just a reality at a time of persecution, which is there are people who in times of persecution gave up their faith. They were scared and in their fear, they basically said, okay, I don't believe, or they, you know, burn their Bibles or whatever uh, to escape to escape death. Now, that is a sinful act. We are called to even sacrifice our lives for the sake of Christ. And the church was dealing with not only lay people who had this issue, but they were dealing with pastors. They were dealing with bishops who had apostatized, and now we're coming back to the faith. And so, Christians had to wrestle with what do we do with these people? Now, there were some that were very harsh that are that basically would just say, 
well, you've cut yourself off from Christ too bad. There's no repentance for you. It's too late. But the majority of Christians wanted to say that, no, you can be restored. However, they want to recognize the seriousness of that, the seriousness of, you know, as you're watching, say you're, you watch your, you know, your parents give up their lives for the faith, and then all of a sudden you see your pastor is too much of a coward and he survives. And he, now he says, well, I want to, uh, I'm sorry, and I want to continue being a pastor. And you think, my parents just lost their lives for Christ, and here's this guy who who just sold out and now he wants to be respected. That's not fair. So you get why they have this attitude. And the solution to this was that there were specific penalties that were given to those who committed such apostasy. They were often forbidden from coming back to the Eucharist for sometimes for years. I mean, it was a significant period of time, often seven years. And you see this discussed at Nicaea actually. And this is a way to say that we need to take sin very seriously. And so there are consequences, right? There are, just as you discipline a child, there is fatherly discipline, as the book of Hebrews talks about. There are different ways to understand that kind of punishment. Tertullian seems to really think about it in a very kind of legal way, a you commit this sin you pay this much for it to pay to kind of pay God back. I mean, that's simplifying it. But Tertullian's language kind of tends toward that direction, which – and Tertullian's so important for the foundation of Western theology that that influence, I think, is the reason why you have this legal satisfaction develop in the West rather than the East. So that's one way of handling it. But even with someone like Tertullian, this is not something that is demanded – of every Christian who commits any sin. This is for, this was done largely because of apostasy. That's the context in which this idea develops and is discussed. But there are two other sins that are generally included that are understood to be so serious that they merit some real discipline from the church. So that includes murder. The seriousness of that one should be rather obvious. The second is adultery, because Christians recognize the the importance of the marital union and the sacredness of the marital union. And so if someone breaks that, this is something that is to be to not be taken lightly by the church. And so there were significant punishments and penalties for those who had committed that sin. So what you have is a system of church discipline that is a way to for the church to teach the seriousness of these three sins in particular that then leads in the earlier medieval periods. So you see this around the time of Gregory. So you've got 600s in, in 700. You see this showing up in, in Ireland among for monks. There is a practice of confessing sins privately that starts to grow. And you are confessing those sins to a pastor or you're confessing those sins to a bishop. That was not mandatory. It was a practice that was more common among monastics. It's more common in some churches, some areas than others. But it was not mandatory that every Christian, in order to be forgiven, whether it's you know eternally forgiven or to have those temporal consequences removed – the idea that every Christian has to do that, that is not made official by the Western church and never is in the East until the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215. So recognize that as we are looking at the the Augsburg Confession and we are looking at the criticisms of what happens within private confession and absolution, recognize that this has only been a necessary universal teaching under the papacy in the Western church since 1215. That's 300 years prior to the Reformation. And it's an insignificant period of time, but this is not something that has some kind of universal history within the church. And Fourth Lateran, same time you've got purgatory, transubstantiation, a lot of these – 
I don't even see transubstantiation as a major issue at all. Uh, but because it might as well, <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's controversial, but, but my take is kind of like transubstantiation more than anything else is kind of a theory. It's a, it's a speculative theory about maybe how this is the body and blood of Christ. And do I think it's the best one? No, but I also don't know that it really matters that much. Uh, that, you know, if I was wrong, and it is a substance accidents thing that's going on in the suburb, I mean, who cares? It's, it's the body of Christ, it's the blood of Christ. I'm really not that concerned. Um, but, so that, that's not a major issue, it, it, though it will be for, you know, a lot of other Protestant groups. That's certainly not going to be the issue for, for Lutherans. As much as we do, yeah, sure, nuance things a little differently. But, but you get purgatory, and you get the withholding of the cup from the laity. A lot of these things happen around around the same time. And so the necessity of going to private confession is one of those. So the decree of the Fourth Lateran Council, I believe it's only that once a year, at least, Christians are called to confess their sins. And from that point forward, the regularity of that confession continues to grow. It now becomes an expectation that this confession is happening on a very regular basis. And the amount of sins that are to be confessed continues to grow exponentially. So, I'm going to keep reading here. Um, oh, and there's the mention of repentance. Just to say, Lutherans talk about repentance all the time. Repentance is really the theme that started the Reformation. I mean, this is what the 95 Theses were really about. It was not even strictly about really justification by faith. It was about repentance. The concern was that there is an understanding that you're kind of buying your way out of purgatory, which is buying your way into heaven. Um, and I know people say, you're not buying your way into heaven because it's just the temporal consequences, whatever. You are buying your way to heaven, okay? I understand the distinction that you're not buying your way out of hell, but you are buying your way into heaven because you're thinking, I can go spend thousands of years suffering that God is punishing me for sins that I have committed, or I can pay money and go see God right away. Nuance it however you want. You're paying to get to heaven, okay? All right, so... This, this then led Luther to the 95 Theses, which is to say that getting, getting to, to heaven, um, being, receiving the, the beatific vision, being the presence of God, is not about paying money or having this kind of this for that legal type of satisfaction that you have to uh, perform or pay or whatever it might be. It's about repentance and faith. The Christian life is repentance. It is daily repentance. So what God is really concerned with is not how much money you're giving to the church, but the nature of the repentant heart. And Luther says that's the nature of the Christian life day to day is a heart of repentance, a life of sincere confession of sins, reception of the forgiveness of sins, and then confessing of sins again. And it's this cycle of repenting and coming before God uh, confessing our sins, feeling the guilt of our sins, receiving the forgiveness of sins, being empowered to strive to follow God's law, failing, confessing, you know, we in this cycle just goes over and over again. And so that's really the concern that Lutherans have here uh, with the nature of how penance developed. All right, then it says, but of confession, our churches teach that the enumeration of sins is not necessary, nor are the consciences to be burdened with the care of enumerating all sins inasmuch as it is impossible to recount all sins. As Psalm 19.13 testifies, who can understand his errors? So also Jeremiah 17.9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But if no sins were remitted except what were recounted, consciences could never find peace because very many sins they can neither see nor remember. So with this, it's now important to give, again, historical context, what's going on here. It was the, it was the belief in the medieval period, and certainly this is the kind of theology that Luther himself was trained under, that when you went to confession, there was an obligation to confess every single one of your sins. And this was on a popular level, on a local level, that's what the priests expected. It was the expectation that when you come to confession, you don't just confess your really bad sins. You don't just confess the sins that you're feeling really guilty about. You don't just confess, you know, sins that you are struggling with, that you've repented of but can't overcome. You need to confess all of your sins. 
This has shifted today, to be clear. If you look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, there is, there's a lot more care here in describing exactly what's required and what isn't. What is required still is the confession of all mortal sins. What isn't required but is highly recommended is a confession of all venial sins. Now, mortal and venial sins, that is a distinction that we make, but it means something very different for us. <laughs> Luther would say that in, in the fullest sense, like if we're being honest about the seriousness of sin, all sin is mortal. In other words, if God really is perfect and his law really is holy, right, and good, and perfectly just, then really any sin that we commit, if it's any less than perfect righteousness, is mortal. In other words, it brings spiritual death. What brought death to Adam and Eve was not just the eating you know, of, of the fruit, but instead it would have been any sin. If Adam and Eve had committed even a small sin, they were still breaking God's law. And the punishment for sin is death, temporal and eternal death, and that's for all sin. So, in a real sense, every sin is mortal. And Luther adamantly makes that point. I think he's exactly right that, well, yes, you could distinguish between degrees of sins in some ways, and certainly like that, okay, some, some sins are going to have worse consequences in the world than others. Before God, they, they all cut us off from perfection. And so they all earn death. So the kind of speaking of sins is like, ah, it's not a big deal. You know, just worry about the really bad ones. <laughs> that's not that's not a right understanding of sin. As Christians, we need to be repentant of all of our sins. So we don't get to just be like, well, I'm gonna confess my mortal sins and not worry about the venial ones. But there is another sense in which the mortal venial distinction has been retained, and that is that it's not that. You can catalog all sins, you know, put them in a list and say, well, this one's mortal, this one's venial. Instead, it's the understanding that if you are living in a way that is in open sin where there is no repentance, that sin becomes mortal. So the question of mortal sin versus venial sin is not so much a particular act, this act versus that act, but it's, is there a repentant heart? Are you living a repentant life as a Christian? And engaging in continual sin with no repentance, that's mortal sin. And where do we take that from? We take that from, you know, the book of First John. First John talks about certain sins that bring death. But we also could go to all of the different apostasy passages. And there are plenty of warnings in Scripture about the threats, really, about living in sin. If you live in sin, you, you know, you can be lost. You cut yourself off from Christ. So those are mortal sins. And we're not going to line it up as, as a series of, you know, this is mortal, this is venial kind of thing. So we want to be careful about that distinction. So when we're seeing somebody for, you know, when I'm absolving sins, I'm not like, ah, don't tell me the little stuff. You know, <laughs> tell me the big ones. <laughs> it's not really, it's not really, not, not that they would have said that either. But um, so Luther understood that. And because all sins are that serious, if we really need to confess sins, we need to, if we need to confess all of our sins, we need to be confessing every bad thought that we've ever had. We need to be thinking about every uh, sin of omission, right? The things that you haven't, haven't done, that you could have done, that's sin. There are times where you could have done something with your time that was not wrong, but it was a bit selfish because you could have been using that time for something better. You see, it is impossible, that's what these texts show, to catalog every single one of your sins. Because as Luther understood, sin is so pervasive in our lives that it is not just that I am sinning when I do you know, action A versus action B, that's true, but sin is also a nature that is within us, a nature that is hopefully being put to death daily and one day will be put to death for good, but it is there alongside of us as our companion <laughs> as much as we don't want it, and so it, it impacts us in a more holistic way. And so today, it is, it is understood that Venial sins don't all have to be confessed, but it's good to do so, but that mortal sins do have to be confessed. However, there are provisions with, like within the catechism that do now make exceptions for, you know, if you can't remember something 
and you have an intent to confess or you had the intent to confess all your sins and you didn't, that kind of counts, <laughs> right? So, I mean, that's, that's good. They've, they've moved in this way. But still, the way that it is often thought of, especially in kind of the popular conscience, and this is something I talk about all the time when we're dealing with the issues in Rome, in, and this is the, concern, the reformer's concern, was it's not just about academic theology. Because we understand that the scholastic theologians have all sorts of distinctions and they know all sorts of things to nuance everything and to make things make more sense. But the question is really, what about the conscience of the person in the pew? How is this really coming down to them? What do they think is going on? So you can make all these distinctions, but does the average person really get all those distinctions? And the reality is the average person is just hearing, well, I need to confess all of my sins or I won't be forgiven. And so then I am forgiven as long as I confess my sins and do the things they tell me to do. It becomes this very simplistic mechanical thing. Even if the theologians recognize there's a lot more to it than that. And, and that's the concern is the burdened conscience. They're seeing the, the pastors, Luther and others are seeing the burdened consciences that people are, are bound by. And so there was a recognition that God forgives all sins if we confess. And so we confess sins that we've done, sins that we've left undone, not loving God with our whole heart. We're talking about our internal selves, you know, thought, word, and deed, that kind of covers it all. We can get specific and private confession, and it's a good thing to do that, but it is not an absolute necessity. God is not waiting for you to confess your sins in order to forgive you. You know, I think another problem that you have with the, the Roman perspective on this, and this is still the case today, but you know, not as in as serious of a way as it was at the time, is that it's there's no exhaustive list of what is a mortal sin versus what is a venial sin. So there, there's no exhaustive list that says this sin is mortal, this sin is venial. And there are a lot of things where it's really unclear. And your sin might be mortal or it might be venial. Now, it is also still the claim today that if you confess if you fail to confess a mortal sin, that you, or if you confess, because you're still kind of holding on to that mortal sin in some way, then that sin is not forgiven and none of your sins are forgiven. There is this kind of continual threat of if you do not confess one of your mortal sins and you know you have it, you just haven't shared it, or you're not really sorry for it, that it is actually not forgiven. And none of your sins are forgiven. So there is still a kind of fear that can certainly be present in a Roman Catholic view of confession and absolution and then penance following that. Okay, and then let's move on to read the rest of this because we're just about out of time here. The ancient writers also testify that the enumeration is not necessary for in the decrees Chrysostom is cited who speaks thus. I do not say to thee that thou shouldst discover thyself in public or accuse thyself before others, but I would have thee obey the prophet when he said, reveal thy way unto the Lord. Therefore, with prayer, confess thy sins before God, the true judge. Pronounce thine errors, not with the tongue, but with the memory of thy conscience. Okay, so there's Chrysostom pretty clearly saying that it's not a necessity to confess every sin sin to another person, including a priest. And on the gloss or of repentance, he admits that confession is of human right only and is not commanded in scripture, but has been instituted by the church. All right, and that, that's kind of where, where we're at. The office of the keys is something that is divinely commanded very clearly. However, the means and manner by which that office is exercised is not explicitly commanded, which is why we have some development in history, and that's okay. Nevertheless, on account of the very great benefit of absolution, as well as for other uses to the conscience, confession is retained among us. All right. So, another question here, just quickly before we end, is what about penance? <laughs> so, clearly, the way that confession is practiced, there isn't penance, certainly not in the Roman Catholic sense. And... I think it's important to clarify because I think people misunderstand this. When we don't believe in penance, when we don't have this, you know, penance that is given, it's not like every time someone confesses a sin to me, I say, okay, well, here's your penance. You've got to do, you know, X, Y, and Z to make sure you, you know, don't suffer the punishments and purgatory. But at the same time, there is a, 
a reality that repentance does lead to what scripture calls fruits of repentance. In other words, we're not like leaving out the, the changed life. What we are saying is that that changed life is still a life that falls into sin and it's not going to be a perfectly changed life. And we have this pattern of, again, repentance and, and forgiveness, but those fruits are going to come out of faith and repentance. And along with that, there is absolutely, and Bill Geertz talks about this, just saying it's not just me, okay? <laughs> but there's absolutely a place for a pastor who's dealing with somebody confessing sins to also give them life advice, right? So if somebody is struggling with a particular sin and they have come to confess that sin to me, it's very serious, or they've come to confess multiple times, I am most importantly going to say, I forgive you all of your sins. They, they have, there's the exercising of the office of the keys, there's absolution. However, I'm also going to talk to them about how to ways to overcome that sin or, or things that they should do. Or, you know, I may say, here, why don't we talk about this? Why don't you spend this much time in prayer or read this text of scripture? So there are things that pastors can, and I think should, bring to people who are struggling with sins that are going to, to aid them. But it's not to be done in such a way that what you're saying is you are making some kind of satisfaction for your sins. Instead, it is saying, I want to help you with those fruits of repentance in, in putting yourself in a place where you are better equipped to fight that sin. Well, there we go. There's the end of this article of the Oxford Confessions. We talk about the importance of confession and absolution and, and how the Lutheran tradition looks at this and how we differ from Rome, especially medieval Rome, but, but still from Rome today as well in significant ways. So I hope you found this helpful. Make sure you subscribe and like the video and subscribe on your podcast app as well if you want just the audio. Listen while you're in your car or while you're cleaning your house or I don't know, whatever it is that you're doing. And we'll see you in the next one. God bless. Thank you.